98 uh, lecture series, and I want to welcome everybody to uh, SciArc. Uh, my name is Neil Denari. I'm the director. And uh, it's a nice uh, turnout, and it's a nice way to, to kind of start the, the semester. Um, before I make a, a kind of an introdu two introductions, one for the series itself and one for BART, uh, we do have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is this uh, fall series is put together by the graduate students, uh, many of whom worked very hard, and I want to uh, credit them. Uh, Poonam Sharma, Jim Sykes, Catherine Chen, Stephanie Besh, Robert Sumrall and Christina Alg. So let's give a round of applause to them. And always to thanks to Margie for her hard work and all of this. Um, there are two lectures uh, coming up, not on the lecture series. Tomorrow, tomorrow at one o'clock, uh, there will be a lecture by a Danish architect by the name of Kim Utsun, who, uh, whose name may be familiar to you, at least in the last name. He's the son of a, uh, uh, also a prominent uh, architect, Jorn Utsun. So he'll be here tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Um, Keith, are you up there? Yeah. Is it in the main space? I don't know. Okay, thank you. Main space or large uh, lecture room, you know where both of those are. So tomorrow at 1 o'clock, uh, it does pretty amazing stuff, so I, I, I urge all of you to come. Um, George Yu, who's a faculty member here, he's teaching uh, in the graduate program. Uh, he's lecturing on October the 5th um, in the faculty lecture series at 5 o'clock. Uh, Russell, is there a, a talk for next Monday? Who's on for next Monday? Uh, George is next Monday. Um, okay. Okay, two, uh, October the 5th, George U, Monday, 5 o'clock in the uh, large lecture room. I want to introduce the uh, series on global uh, perspectives, as it says on the uh, lecture poster, and to use uh, uh, one way of uh, analyzing this concept of the global relative to uh, a kind of an analog, and that's the computer. For anybody who's used the computer, you know that there's a global and a local condition inside the box. Uh, in, in modeling software. And for those of you who haven't, the global and the local conditions are basically there's a zero, zero point in this sort of infinite field modeling territory. And then when you have a local condition, it's based on any piece of geometry or object that you make. And it to itself has a local condition. If you want to rotate a form or a column, you can rotate it about, about a particular center within that uh, field, or you can rotate it about its own local condition. It's kind of curious that this particular aspect of modeling software, uh, in, in modeling software, kind of articulates the same questions about global and local conditions. And it's further, I think, articulated when you add this concept of texture mapping. You know, uh, when you texture map in the local condition onto a face of a piece of geometry, the texture goes on without distortion. It may be a little bigger, it may be a little smaller, but it, uh, it wants to go on with a certain sense of fidelity or eidetic quality. But when you texture map something in the global, especially if it's a curving surface, you've seen textures that seem to be uh, understood at one uh, part of the geometry and then it radically distorts when it's projected beyond it. Again, that sort of articulates the idea that the local is the authentic, and the local is the sort of um, truthful, the, the kind of eidetic uh, condition. It is as it's stated somehow, whereas the global distorts. The global has a projection system that, with 
a, a, a kind of radical sense of undifferentiation just projects phenomena across geometry. And so when we think about globalism, we think about the global, we think about globalism, we think about globalization. And the primary condition beyond the idea that the global is simply the world, um, the possibility of the loss incurred in the concept of languages which continue to spread out across the world, where at some level, perhaps in America, our own sense of uh, what culture is may be uh, truthful, it may be authentic, but by the time those concepts of economies and capitalism literally get projected onto this sort of conceptually spherical surface, clearly there are areas that are tremendously distorted, out of whack, have no particular relation you know, to that context. And I, I think that this idea of the computer and this sort of black field that you stare into when you're rendering those nice forms, that black field beyond represents the kind of possibility of endlessness, of repetitiousness, of undifferentiated uh, conditions. Um, another kind of great factor in all of this is the relationship between the idea of real terrain and economies. Uh, when we realize that if California were a separate country, its uh, economy would rate seventh in the world. It's, uh, it would be the seventh largest GNP in the world. But we're hooked into you know, a, a larger system of capitalism here in the United States. And when you talk about conditions of terrain, of real land, as a kind of productive territory versus um, the relationship between economy, wealth, there's tremendous distortions literally between territories and their accompanying sort of economies. And I think that that, um, that certainly is apparent in the uh, amazing and, and totally beautiful exhibition that, that uh, Bard has brought uh, that you see outside because certainly you can see a sort of contextually economic texture mapped condition on top of uh, localized fields, the way in which this global condition does those things. Now I say this of course as a setup to the entire series that will clearly explore uh, the phenomena and the effects and to the extent that any one speaker generates an emotion about the incurrence of loss or the potential production of wealth. There is a very large matrix, a conceptual matrix out there that all of these facts go into. And so I think it'll be quite nice to hear and see uh, this series kind of evolve relative to, uh, to these particular questions. Uh, Bart Lotzma was born in 1957 in Amsterdam. He's Dutch. Uh, he took a degree from uh, the Eindhoven University of Technology in uh, the history of architecture and theory. And he uh, studied uh, the very well-known uh, project of the Brussels Pavilion by Le Cluzier, uh and Giannis Zanakis um, and Edgar Varese, uh sound designers for his uh, final uh, dissertation. Um, he is um, certainly one of the strongest voices in not only Dutch uh, contemporary uh, criticism, contemporary criticism, but I think uh, really in Europe and certainly with his presence and, and activities here uh, in the States, I think that we'll see um, a greater degree of, of exposure of his writing uh, and ideas in the United States. Uh, he's written countless uh, articles. He's working on finishing a book now on, uh, on Dutch contemporary architecture. Um, and uh, his uh, work is, is, I think, going to be um, very, very important for all of us here in America um, to, uh, to engage in. Um, I understand from uh, him and also from Rumor on their Asian trip, which they spent uh, one month um, Bard took 116 rolls of film in a month. Uh, I didn't do the math, but that's a huge number of, of images, uh, just a, 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 probably a, a, an incredible um, kind of array of, of images that, that couldn't even be possibly 
uh, kind of contained in a lecture or an, an exhibition, um, I think we could learn something from uh, that level of uh, kind of uh, cultural awareness in a way. Um, I think this is kind of an amazing uh, uh, project. Um, he's working on exhibitions of his photography and installations um, in Austria and at the Pompidou Center in Paris and also at the Kunsthalle in, in Vienna. Um, so please help me and welcome Bart Lotzma. Thank you, uh, Neil, and thank you all very much for coming. It's a very warm welcome. Uh, also, also on, um, on behalf of Rumer van Torn, who uh, unfortunately could not be here, I want to express my gratitude for inviting us over here for the, for the exhibition and this lecture. It's a, it's a wonderful occasion to show this, 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 this work because you need a lot of space uh, to, to, for, for it. And as you may have noticed, uh, the, uh, the, the exhibition consists of two parts, uh, one made by Room of Torn, that's in the front uh, there, and by the entrance, and my photographs are in the, in the gallery. So it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, everyone who has helped us in getting the exhibition here. It is, of course, of course Neil and Marjorie Reeve and Anne Sweat, but also the people that are so, were so generously helping me uh, to put, putting it up, like Jennifer, Rob, Faro, and Patrick, who gave us a ride to the hotel, because we're pretty handicapped because we don't have a driver's license, which is not the easy thing in, uh, in this place. Um, so, and there's a guy uh, who borrowed us his uh, chalk line, and I hope, uh, before I forget it, please come forward after the lecture so that I can uh, return it to you. Anyway, uh, Syarch is one of the nicest places, I would say, uh, to visit in terms of the warmth of the reception uh, one gets here. I mean, the installation in the hallway here by the, by the entrance that some of you made, especially for me, uh, is, is really uh, touching. I, I, I've really never seen uh, anything uh, uh, the like, and I will, I will certainly never forget it. And actually, I already told you, but the sweets it is made of uh, are the same sweets my, uh, uh, I used to get from my grandmother when I was a little kid about 40 years ago. So you certainly touched a, a, a weak spot uh, there. Um, the photographs uh, in the exhibition and in my lecture today I will, will be more or less three parts. One part where I, where I will explain a bit of the background of this trip. The second part I will mainly uh, have a, a slideshow. And the third part I will get a bit deeper into uh, Guangzhou. <coughs> the photographs in the exhibition and in my lecture um, were all taken on a study trip of almost a month, like Neil said, through Southeast Asia. And we made a trip last November. Um, on this trip, we visited uh, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Hanoi, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, that's in China, Guangzhou, Zhuhai, Macau, and Hong Kong, so the Pearl River Delta, and before we flew back to the Netherlands. We had meetings with city planners, historians, bankers, housing corporations, developers, politicians, and architects in all those places. Maybe it's good to first explain something. I'll put it up uh, because you can see my face anyway. Uh, maybe it's good to first explain something about the context of this trip. Um, it was initiated and, and funded by the Dutch Fund for Individual Subsidies for the Visual Arts, Design, and Architecture. And it was organized by the Dutch Architectural Institute. And the fund is an institution that gives grants uh, to individuals. And these could be, for example, grants to uh, study at a school abroad, grants to start up an office for young architects within two years after they have finished their studies, uh, like the ones, for example, in a 9 plus 1 exhibition. Uh, grants to take a kind of sabbatical from office work or to help qualitatively uh, good offices uh, through hard times, uh, to do research, uh, a particular, particular project, or to present one's work uh, in an exhibition or in a book. Rem Kohlhaas's uh, SMLXL, for example, was for a large part financed by such grants. And uh, the fund uh, gives grants to make study trips. Uh, already very early on in, uh, in the 90s, 
uh, this fund uh, discovered that actually a lot of people would ask grants for the same kind of trips. So it was decided that it would be much better, cheaper and much more effective to organize collective trips uh, for groups of about 20 architects to certain destinations. And the trip to Asia that we undertook here uh, was uh, actually the fourth of those. The first trips were to, to Japan, with, which uh, I was so lucky to join as well, uh, to Los Angeles, to Brazil, and there was a trip to investigate the high-speed tra high train network as it is uh, developing in, uh, in Europe. And as you can see, underlying all these trips, there is a kind of uh, interest in uh, what one might call the rise of the mega cities, as it's also the title of one part of Rumors exhibition, and in infrastructure. Even though the first trip to Japan uh, uh, still mainly focused on architectural highlights uh, lights in an almost, I would say, kind of 80s um, uh, manner. <clears throat> I was still on the, on the committee of this, this fund when the decision was made to go to Asia. And I remember that we had a choice between proposals to go to the old Donau cities uh, in Central Europe and this one. And, then, uh, and I, I remember myself saying uh, in the demagogical way that, uh, that sometimes uh, esca escapes you, uh, uh, that even though I thought the old Europe, Central European culture is fascinated, fascinating and I've spent several years there, I would like to make a choice for the future, uh, which meant Asia. And uh, so it was decided. And shortly after, uh, I, I left the committee and I was lucky that I could apply to uh, and I was chosen to, the, to, the, to, the very, to join the very same trip I had chosen myself. Um, also on this trip, uh, we, were, we were all together with about uh, 20 people. Architects, interior architects, urban designers, landscape architects, critics and theoreticians, selected from uh, about 100 of uh, applicants. A series of articles uh, of the participants of this trip, uh, in English as well, you will find in the first uh, five or six issues of Archis uh, of this year, uh, of which I will make sure your, your library will get some copies. Maybe they're already on their way. And then there is a small booklet uh, uh, published by the Architectural Institute with contributions of all the participants, because there's this democratical thing that, that has to happen in the Netherlands. And uh, there was, of course, an, a small exhibition at, uh, at, the, at the building of this fund where also everyone participated, more or less. So that, that all happened, and now everyone can more or less do with this material what he or, or she would like. I have to explain something else, though, because it may, may, it, it, it may be a bit surprising that, this, this, that these things are organized by these kind of state or, sa or sa semi-governmental kind of organizations. Uh, and you have to understand that, that, it, that, that, it, that the context of this trip is quite different from what it would be for, from, from a similar thing in the USA, uh, where here uh, theory, teaching, and criticism work on a large distance from the daily practice of architecture, all uh, the people that went on this trip uh, work in some way in an immediate practice. I myself, for example, uh, I was announced here as a, I'm announced here as a thesis tutor at the Berlage Institute. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I'm a critic, of course, and I'm on the board of different magazines, but that's not so important. But maybe more important to understand how this works, I'm also on the board, uh, uh, of, uh, I'm also on the committee of the city of Arnhem, which is a city in the eastern part of, of the Netherlands, that judges all urban and architectural plans that are made there, that, that people want to realize there, on their architectural quality. And we give an immediate advice to the mayor and the eldermen in regards to uh, if they should, these, these should be realized and to the future development of the city. And one of the projects we, we deal with is, for example, uh, Ben van Berkel's uh, project for the station area, which you might have seen uh, published. And other critics uh, and theoreticians or theories uh, that came on this trip have similar functions. So our interest in this trip is not just theoretical, but also very immediately uh, practical. I'm also telling you this uh, to, uh, to you so that you do not get the impression that I'm a kind of expert or specialist on uh, on Asia, uh, on a or on Asian cities. I noticed that there are a lot of people here, maybe more than in the Netherlands, that have actually traveled these cities or were even born there. Uh, but I'm telling you this in the first place because, in a way, I will be talking more about the Netherlands, or at least we'll be talking from a Dutch perspective, than about Asia, in a way, even if that would be between the lines. 
So to understand, uh, to understand why the fund is organizing these trips to these very specific destinations, one has to understand a little about the situation architecture and urbanism find themselves in in the Netherlands. Uh, because the reasons uh, are, are very direct, practical and political, and not so much theoretical as they might be in other Western countries. Since, since the Second World War, uh, the Netherlands are uh, going through a period of an, uh, a great expansion, as you, as you probably know. Now, now already the population density of the Netherlands uh, is larger than Japan's. And the second wave of this expansion uh, that is taking place now has not so much to do with population growth, uh, although the, the population is still growing, but with the economical, sociological and political development of the, of the country. Economically, the Netherlands are doing exceptionally uh, well at the moment, and people uh, get more individual wealth, so they want larger spaces. Sociologically, the basis of society is no longer the nuclear family, but people are living in all kinds of constellations from single to single parent family to family, or what other kind of constellation you might imagine. All these units in the Netherlands have the right on an individual home from the, from, the, from the age of 18. And as you can imagine, this results in an incredible increase in built substance. The sprawl of uh, this becomes bigger than before, uh, because forced by the new lords, uh, laws in the European community, uh, the Netherlands is forced, forced to deregulate the planning and building process. This it becomes more and more dependent of market forces, and the market demands individual homes, uh, not the kind of socialist housing units we, we used to have. Nevertheless, these individual homes, or at least homes that allow for and express uh, more individual lifestyles will have to be realized in densities that for the Netherlands and, and for all of Europe uh, are without precedence as the country is getting fuller and fuller and nature or I would say or rather say green spaces are very much under threat. And apart from this we will have to integrate into this landscape incredible amounts of infrastructure to be able to continue functioning as a small uh, country depending on trade in a globalizing economy. So. This, this process of individualization is uh, uh, crucial for, the, for a second phase of modernization that we find ourselves in. Maybe not just in the Netherlands, but uh, generally in the Western world. And this second phase of modernization is a phenomenon that is very much linked to the global political, economical, and cultural developments that were accelerated in 1989 when the communist world is still quite unexpectedly, uh, for us Europeans, uh, fell apart. And individualization means in this respect, according to uh, uh, the German sociologist uh, Ulrich Beck, first the disembedding and second the re-embedding of industrial uh, society uh, ways of life by new ones in which individuals must produce, stage and couple together their bi biographies themselves, thus the name individualization. Individualization therefore means that the standard biography becomes a chosen biography, a do-it-yourself biography, or when confronted with the limits of possibilities as they are defined by others, a reflexive biography. That does not necessarily have anything to do with civil courage or personality, but rather with diverging options and the compulsion to present, to present and produce these bastard children of one's own and others' uh, decisions as a unity. So there's nothing idealist or, or humanist or sentimental about this. Disembedding and re-embedding, in the words of uh, Anthony Giddens that I've chosen for uh, the title of my part of the exhibition, of different ways of life do not occur by chance, nor voluntarily, nor through diverse types of historical conditions, but rather all at once uh, and under the general conditions of the welfare state in developed uh, in the industrial labor society as they have developed uh, since the 1960s in many Western uh, industrial countries. But as Rem Kohlhaas uh, writes in his magnificent uh, Singapore Songlines uh, text in SMLXL, the Western is no longer our exclusive domain. Except uh, perhaps in uh, the regions of its origins, it now represents a condition of universal aspiration. It is no longer something we have unleashed, uh, no longer something wh uh, whose consequences we therefore have the right to deplore. It is a self-administered process that we do not have the right to deny in the name of various sentimentalities to those others who have long since made it their own. At most, we are like dead parents 
deploring the mess our children have made of their inheritance. So maybe the largest difference in that sense between the Southeast Asian megacities and the Western examples, uh, maybe that is that the Asians jump all at once from a traditional and mainly agricultural form of society to a second modernity, thereby almost completely skipping uh, the industrial phase and all its consequences that we went through. That means that they immediately jump from a society in which localities, traditional forms of authority and knowledge play an important role to a society that has global relationships, demands highly specialized scientific and technological expertise and a completely different organizational form. All Asian cities that we visited, including Hanoi, uh, that still remains in an almost unspoiled condition, uh, all these cities aim for a light electronic industry. The phase of cheap manufacturing of shoes and clothes is only a kind of intermediate uh, stepping stone uh, for, for all of them. This kind of production based on the availability of uh, cheap labor, I mean this, this, this cheap production, uh, hops from one country to another until it will finally move to Africa, a process that is already in the beginning. So one of the things that struck me is that all these the people there are constantly studying, even when you go to a, camp, a kampong or a shanty town, the first thing you see is piles of books. Uh, and I must say that I was impressed by the educational level of these people in, in all these countries. Um, as you can imagine, uh, apart from the, from the facts I mentioned, uh, the fact that Ram Kohlhaas had, has put Asia on the agenda was an important incentive to undertake this trip. On the other hand, uh, maybe also Ram's interest in these places is very Dutch, even if he wouldn't like to hear me saying that. Asia has always been important to the Dutch. In history, when we think of our former colonies in Indonesia and our trading posts in Japan and China, and now when we think of the interests of Dutch multinational companies over there and uh, the competition of harbors like Singapore and Hong Kong uh, uh, with Rotterdam, which is until now still the largest port in the world, but that won't last long anymore. Um, maybe briefly before I go to these slides, uh, notwithstanding uh, the, the current crisis uh, in Asia, uh, it is the success of the tiger states that disinquiets and worries the Western countries. Uh, it creates an atmosphere in which there is actually a desire to learn from them, for their, from their efficiency, in order to be able to remain com competitive and finally to survive them, if not to beat them. Although not always being very clear about what kind of things he would mean, Rem Kohl has, has said many times that the same mechanisms that are at work in Asia will come to the Western countries as well. Uh, and when we look at Dutch architecture, or rather Dutch urban design and planning, one can already distinguish two tendencies that were loosely but nevertheless clearly borrowed from Southeast Asian models. One tendency one could describe as a desire to create a series of free zones or acceleration zones in the Netherlands in which large, large parts of the normal national laws and regulations would be suspended. Similar, uh, one might say, in a, in a way to, uh, to, to the way how the Chinese install so-called special economical zones in, for example, the Pearl River Delta and along the coast, where they experiment with capitalist models to prepare the country for the global capitalism that they realize will, be, will inevitably uh, come to China as well. Adrian Geuze and West 8, Rem Kohlhaas and OMA, just as well as an NL architects that were in the 9 plus 1 exhibition, and the artist Joop van Lieshout all recently launched polemical proposals or maybe not even polemical proposals, for smaller or larger of such free zones in the Netherlands. The most sh shamelessly uh, Chinese one, including uh, photo montages of golf courses between industrial plants and many postmodern buildings, is OMAs. The most ambitious one is West AIDS, that wants to revive the spirit of uh, post-war uh, reconstructions of the 50s in which the polders and the large dams were created in the Netherlands. Most of these proposals are more or less aligned with the current dominant infrastructure in the harbor of Rotterdam. Others propose smaller zones, the size of, let's say, the former walled city in Hong Kong or, or other smaller place or, or a quarter. All of these plans feed on a certain unease with the stagnation in development 
in the Netherlands. Uh, the, the question is, uh, though, if this stagnation takes place uh, just because of these rules and regulations, that is, that they, uh, that they have become meaningless, or that these rules and regulations are actually the symptom of the congestion that takes place. That is, or that would be that these rules and regulations come into being because more and more individual developments clash and the jurisprudence that derives from these clashes is formalized. In that case, uh, these rules and regulations would be difficult to avoid and actually rather smoothen, smoothen the processes than stagnate them, how frustrating they may seem. The other tendency, therefore, uh, tries to deal with uh, systems of zoning, building rules and regulations in a similar way as they do in Hong Kong, for example, within which they try to restore or refine another freedom for individualization that is now lost or difficult to achieve in the Netherlands. The most striking examples are Case Christiaanse and probably MVRDV that you know. Uh, the book of MVRDV on density, Pharmax, uh, will come out uh, next month, and the next one, uh, Datascapes is due for spring uh, next year. So these architects see the si sy uh, system of rules and regulations more in the way the sociologist Anthony Giddens sees them, as the manifestations of abstract systems or expert systems. These are institutional networks governed by specialists who found their decisions and authority on scientific facts and methods. Uh, these networks penetrate all layers of society at the global level just as well uh, on the level of the everyday life of the individual. And according to Giddens, these new structures of authority are typical manifestations of the reflexive society of the uh, second modernity. Um, so I will, I will get back to this later. So I went uh, to Asia as an architectural critic. And because that is what, what I normally do, I write about architecture, about what architects do and think. And that is always, of course, very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, I often realize that I write about only a mar marginal percentage of the architectural production, or better, of the production of the built environment. Somehow, one would like to deal with that, that other part as well, but how to do it? Or, as Bob Somel asked on a somewhat different occasion, dealing with a Las Vegas casino, can there be architectural criticism without architecture? And I think there are many reasons why this question will gain importance over the next decades. A smaller and smaller part of the environment will in the near future be designed by architects, uh, if we would stick to the old definition. Or formulated the other way around, maybe it will still be architects who will uh, be formally designing the built environment, but they will lose much of their traditional authority. This authority will be taking o taken over uh, by all kinds of different conglomerates uh, of systems, of rules and regulations, exactly by these abstract systems and their expert re representatives uh, that Anthony Giddens is talking about. For that reason, I think architectural criticism, the criticism will have to change as well. But how? Well, to, 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 to investigate that, of course, South, Southeast Asia is a perfect occasion because there's no architecture there. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, apart from a, fru from a few examples, uh, uh, architecture is limited at best to the two inches uh, the facade is uh, thick. And if architects did, thi uh, did things, somehow they seem more painful, inadequate, in inappropriate, and alienating than the other stuff. That was uh, certainly some kind of uh, discovery during this trip. Good. One, one could start talking about these cities from a theoretical point of view, projecting a conceptual diagram on them and try to make it readable and understandable by, by means of that. But somehow the concepts I've been thinking about all seem to be too distant, too much generalizing, too much big gestures to get in touch with the material. And as Anthony Giddens said, in explaining social change, no single and sovereign mechanism can be specified. There are no keys that will unlock the, mis unlock the mysteries of human uh, social development, reducing them to a unitary f formula or that will account for the major transitions between societal types in such a way either. And all these kind of places are in a kind of uh, uh, period of transition. So I took the occasion in the first place to look and see, and the seeing became somehow an act the first act of criticism, one, may, one, one might say, uh, when I took the photos, when I selected frames in these vast uh, man-made landscapes. 
And I must say, when, when I was selected for this trip, the first thing I did was buy a, a, a large wide-angle uh, camera. What is that? One would say six by nine uh, centimeters, or a real large format camera. Because I wanted to select very carefully, and I remembered from my trip for, to Japan that I took too many pictures, uh, 60 films that were. And also, I wanted all these details to come out, all these repetitions of windows and all these people. Uh, but uh, very soon, this camera seemed to be very impractical because it was too big, because it took too much time, and because when you had put it up immediately, everyone was, was, was putting their child in front of the lens to be photographed. So that, that didn't work. So I got back to the 35 millimeter and motor drive and ended up shooting these 116 films. Um, that is not just a kind of indulgence, but I think um, this kind of filmic aspect of it is, is quite, uh, quite crucial. And I would say this, the second act of criticism would be uh, the selection that I'm, that I made here in this exhibition. Uh, to end this, uh, this theoretical kind of thing up very quickly, what is of course most striking about Southeast Asia are, that are the masses of people and the masses of buildings. One has to think of Nietzsche who called man that disease of the skin of the earth. But at the same time it becomes clear that the relationship between man and built environment is a very strange one. As Bernard Cash writes, the causes of life always escape us, which is why we can provide niches uh, which, in which it can take place. There is a definite r r uh, relationship between the people that make a city grow and expand and the built structure that seems to be almost immediate, uh, the, the almost immediate result of that. But in the end, it is not. And finally, nothing is used uh, the way it was intended. And for the people who live there, these larger intentions do not seem to matter at all. They are a mere background for their own individual lives that they try to cobble together. It is a, as if everyone lives in a kind of underworld, as uh, the American uh, uh, writer Don DeLillo calls it in the uh, magnificent novel I read this vacation. So let me first, because otherwise time is going by, what time is it? Uh, show you very quickly uh, some images of, uh, of this trip before I uh, get a little bit more specific. I will make some strange moves because you never know. Yeah, okay. So we started our trip in Singapore, which is a very strange experience for, for the Dutch because we, we came there on a, on a very sleepy Sunday, uh, Sunday we arrived there and there's nothing going on. And, and not only that, but it looks incre incredibly boring. Uh, everything is constantly cleaned in this tropical uh, city of uh, excellence, as they call it here. You can see even that in the harbor, they have a special device to clean the harbor. There you see a center uh, to which I will later get back. Maybe I should point it out. This is the hotel or the series of hotels that you will see interiors of and that are also in the exhibition. That's a Marine Mandarin Hotel by John uh, Portman. But from the outside, absolutely uh, boring. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is disgusting. Uh, well, very Dutch. And it is no coincidence because Singapore, uh, the, both the planning of Singapore and even the organization of the housing corporation is, is for a large part uh, based on the Dutch uh, system, but in a much more radical way. So you walk around there, be it in this, this business center or, 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 or downtown, and there's really nothing happening. You come into these quarters where the people live. You, don't, you hardly see the people, only some remains of the fun they maybe once had, and especially these kind of signs that really nothing is allowed. In all the introductions, uh, in all the introductions that, uh, that, that we got there from offices or uh, architects' offices or, from, or let's say governmental offices, they always started, and that's, that's, that's no joke, uh, with a 30-minute explanation why the, the death penalty is a good thing. And um, that is, of course, because we were Westerns coming there. But when, when it is really very fascinating to see that Singapore is the only city-state or country in Southeast Asia that has no corruption, or at least no apparent corruption. And that is uh, quite important when you would see the other places. So here you see this absolute boredom and still these kind of gray skies because of the fires in Indonesia. These kind of 
places that they have installed for this traditional kind of street life of the Chinese, but that are, seem to be hardly used. Some of these uh, pl uh, places that Trem uh, talks about in, uh, in his essay, this is the Golden Mile Complex, this kind of uh, very spectacular building, apartments uh, and a lot of functions uh, inside, kind of mega structures, but still with a kind of very uh, traditional Chinese influence, the same as this, uh, People's Park Complex, a kind of huge uh, kind of complex, but underneath it you, you have this kind of uh, traditional kind of uh, Chinese uh, street life, but then on a, on a really large uh, scale. The shop houses that they, still, uh, that they now restore because they realized that it was getting too boring, but then they're restored in such a way that they're actually modern places. And here you can see a little of this boredom in this uh, place, Bujis, uh, that, um, uh, that, that's going on. There is absolutely nothing to do except shopping. And the shopping becomes very important because you're there with, what, what, what is it, I know, never know these Fahrenheit things, but it's, it's almost 40 degrees, the humidity of 70%, and then you see this, this Christmas kind of atmosphere that is everywhere with snow on the roof. Uh, but it is very clear that, that Christmas does not have the kind of meaning that we attach to it in the, in the Western world maybe, but it's, it's, it's not like the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ, but it's the, 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 the kind of, uh, feast of uh, Saint Claus, uh, which is the guy that brings all the presents. And then suddenly, the only, when you realize how to use this place, you realize you shouldn't be, be walking around in the streets, because it's too hot, you should take all these kind of interior kind of corridors and malls, uh, and then you, you'll find a completely different world. These are actually the interiors of this absolutely boring hotel by John Portman, uh, there are three of these hotels, absolutely uh, spectacular. On the left, you see it uh, during daytime. Huge hotels, you, get, you really get an Im immense sense of vertigo. And here at night, where you have to imagine that it's dark and the light is dimmed, and uh, they, there's a, a kind of small orchestra playing uh, like uh, Las Vegas uh, kind of uh, evergreens. Evergreens are important, and uh, I will come back to that. So after this, this, this place where we went to, which was actually very strange because it was at the same time so familiar uh, to, to the Dutch situation, we came to Kuala Lumpur. And that is maybe uh, the city that is uh, the, the most opposed uh, to that. Uh, quite corrupt, a chaotic city, a lot of speculation, and also a city in which it is still for some cultures important to express their kind of cultural identity, uh, mainly uh, the kind of Muslim identity. This is taken from the largest uh, 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 mosque uh, over there, which is really huge. It's the largest mosque in, uh, in Asia. So underneath there is an incredible kind of uh, travel agency for all the people that want to go to Mecca. And on the left you see this strange mixture of these isolated towers, uh, uh, sometimes uh, st with, 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 st with still with the kampongs uh, between those. And here you can see this kind of continuation of this kind of Muslim or traditionally Moorish identity, both in like, let's say, the colonial architecture that is still there, this is a part of the railway station, and the newer towers uh, that they're building there. That's one of the older uh, towers built by Petronas. And of course, the new Petronas Tower, which also seems somehow to hint at this, at this kind of Muslim thing. But these are probably the highest twin towers in the world which is uh, which are very proud of and you see, this is the way you see them from your hotel with the water with the condensation on the outside it was very interesting for us to see that uh, it was very striking that the dutch architects were mainly interested again in the kind of 70s architecture that these asian people have uh, left behind you could see this as a kind of mvrdv uh, building architect is completely uh, unknown but it really works that way. It's a very weird building, the 70s, so it's a bad building. Inside are all kind of brothels and, and, and criminality. Uh, there are these kind of, uh, kind of companies that read uh, Pacific Oil Company, members only, and uh, that is what takes place in this kind of architecture in their, their opinion. Uh, 
And then, of course, in the middle of that are these kind of, of kampongs. Uh, that where people still live in incredibly primitive conditions, although not as poor as one might think, think and with these incredible piles of books which they're which they studying all the time. This is at, at night where you can see the absolutely chaotic aspect uh, character of, the, of these cities, where it's impossible to, uh, to, uh, to walk or to get, almost to get from one place to another. Here, then suddenly other sites are revealed like these kind of places, uh, the Chinatown you have, of course, but also like especially the Tamils that have a kind of small restaurants in these kind of, uh, under these kind of conditions. But on the other hand, then suddenly architecture appears in this kind of conditions, but just sometimes. You have to get to, this is kind of, this is the way they treat uh, landmarks, which was a problem that again that his, 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 his historical character of the cities was removed because they built these uh, these somewhat higher buildings in between so then you would have this situation which they thought was bad, and this is kind of the way they preserve landmarks by just flipping this uh, this facade again in front of it and this is uh, literally presented by the, by the city council as something they're very proud of. And then there are, of course, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, some of the most ambitious projects in Asia. This is the linear city. This is a city uh, in which uh, Peter Cook is actually actual, uh, actively involved. It, uh, he's, he's one of the advisors. In, the, in a back room, there were similar proposals uh, by Calatrava and other uh, famous architects, but it was the Peter Cook's game they, they chose. And this is a project over the river, and it is a very complex project uh, in, in, that, in that, that sense that uh, this developer that, uh, that, uh, that envis uh, and, and envisioned this, uh, this, uh, envisioned this idea uh, suddenly saw that this river was the only piece of land in Kuala Lumpur which was still in public hands. All the rest is, uh, is, is owned by Speculum. And he was allowed to develop this, this river. It's a, actually kind of immense shopping mall with, as you can see on top, uh, a kind of uh, 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 forest or, or villages with, uh, with, uh, with small restaurants in it uh, over this river as a kind of bridge, as a kind of walking city, uh, literally, if he would at the same time uh, clean the river. So the largest part of the project is about cleaning this river, which means that all the kampongs have to be removed. And I, it's not that these people are just removed, but that means, it really means that they build new housing for them. Then the liver, river is uh, channeled, uh, cleared, and then they can start uh, building this project. And as I understood, uh, almost a half a year ago, they started it. When we were there, we, we asked them, well, is this crisis a problem? And they said, uh, well, it will slow things down a little bit, but it seems that in the meantime, they have started building this, uh, this project. It's a two and a half mile long shopping mall. There are also other, uh, I mean, especially Kuala Lumpur is the place where you have the most kind of extreme uh, plans. This is a thing that is already realized. This is a hotel, a shopping mall, ice skating ring uh, combined with a horse track in a kind of uh, Islamitic style outside of the city. And what you see on the left are actually the artist's impressions of the new city they are building there. This is, uh, this is, the, uh, 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 this is Putrajaya and that's also called the Multimedia Super Corridor. That's a whole new city with the, where the, the, the center of the government will move to uh, with a complete new uh, electronic infrastructure and with all kinds of facilities for electronic kind of uh, uh, business. And then you think, well, are they really gonna do this? And actually, no one believed that they were really gonna, going to do this. And the people that prepared the trip went there the first time to check everything out and they were not allowed to go there. But when we were there, we would go there, and they said, well, maybe, maybe it's all a fake. But then we took these large four-wheel uh, drive kind of buses, and we went there, and what you then actually see, you, when you're driving up to a hill, it's nothing, is that they completely erased the kind of forest that used to be there, and that they have actually begun to build these cities. 
as you saw on this image on the left, the whole style of this city will be a kind of Michael Graves postmodernism, or as they would call it, this is going to be a city of evergreens. And that's, that's the kind of serious idea that they have about it. So, sorry. After that, we went to a completely uh, different place, which is Hanoi in Vietnam. And that is a country that is still in a kind of uh, virginal state, agricultural uh, kind of uh, society with very traditional kind of forms of authority. Although, uh, when you come in from the airport, you'll see, already see these things uh, uh, appearing. In this case, Fiat, but it's mainly the, were the Korean firms that were involved there. And Vietnam, uh, Hanoi is a very kind of, it's a beautiful city, I must say, and uh, with, with beautiful people and very, very friendly people. It's, it has now three and a half million uh, kind of inhabitants and it's still growing. Uh, OMA has made a large uh, secret uh, master plan which will actually, uh, I think, uh, make this city five times as big. But the idea is that this historical center will remain. We have to uh, wait in, uh, and if this will happen uh, now, of course. Uh, but this is the kind of uh, atmosphere that you, that you find there. And it's still partly French, one might say, partly really Vietnamese. And also here, you might imagine that these buildings are very old, but they're probably no older than, let's say, uh, 10 to, to 20 years. They age uh, much quicker. And as you can see, also in Hanoi, the kind of postmodern style is the, the kind of favorite style. But what, what, what struck us here for the first time are these masses of people that actually uh, live there and live in the street and that's this kind of fluent kind of, kind of combination of this, this architecture, of this city and the people that live there. And the way it grows, how they use, for example, on the one hand, very simple rules for the parcellation of this city. On the other hand, also how they, they use the fact that many people built their houses illegally. And that's very convenient because it makes it possible to make a kind of ad hoc kind of uh, big roads when, for example, like when we were there, the kind of French, uh, kind of French speaking countries would meet, then would, they would immediately make this big road uh, through this kind of, uh, 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 of architecture. And then you would see a house that would only be one and a half meter thick after that because they immediately rebuilt uh, the facade. It's still in a very virginal state, no cars, but only these kind of Honda scooters. And it is very fascinating how they use, as you can see there, there's the kind of first traffic light that they had that was installed because of this uh, francophone kind of meeting. But in general, all this traffic is uh, moves through each other uh, very slowly, very gently, uh, very nicely. And the only thing you hear constantly are these kind of uh, uh, beepers of these motorcycles, not because there's a reason to it, not because something dangerous is happening, but more or less like sheep do that when they, uh, when they, uh, so that, and that, that, that sound fills this whole, whole, whole city. It's very, it's very friendly, I must say. So, oh. anyway. And still, what is allowed since recently, and that is actually the first step towards this kind of globalization is that actually people are allowed to, to sell uh, some of the kind of uh, vegetables and fruits they, uh, they have on, uh, on, their, on their small farms and bring them into the country. So you see these women that walk for three or four hours with like five oranges and, uh, and sell them in the city and, and go back. And that is actually what you see on the, on the left side. But also, for example, the dust that remains when uh, a ship with, with, with coal, uh, well, when they take the coal out from this dust, they make these briquets. And there's this very famous story about this bridge, or rather the other bridge, by the way, that was the only bridge that during the war connected uh, Hanoi to the, uh, to the harbor. And uh, because of that, it's a bridge within the middle, there is uh, the railway track, and on the s one side there is a road, and on the other. So the, these, these large trucks would come in with food and leave empty, so the whole bridge would, uh, how do you say that, would, uh, would sink in one direction. 
And a typical kind of Vietnamese uh, uh, solution for was that to reverse the kind of way they would, uh, these trucks would come in and out, and then it would uh, get, uh, get right again. And this idea of this very slow kind of development uh, based on more generations and on many, uh, let's say, small individuals that has large effects is uh, something, is, is somehow, uh, was somehow very impressive. And an important lesson to, to, to learn there. Also, the way how people make their own space, even if there is no architecture. And about speaking about traditional, what you see, still see here in Vietnam is these kind of traditional kind of authorities. In this case, uh, a traditional uh, Vietnamese doctor. So a lot of the kind of sociological changes you can still see. And then you can see that the children are wearing these small kind of imitation Calvin Klein bags, and even the smallest ones are selling these Pepsi Cola already. So then very quickly to Hong Kong, I won't say too much about that, except that on the one hand it seems to be again like a kind of charcoal uh, that is on these, uh, that is built on these islands. On the other hand, again these masses of people, and what what uh, what. Uh, Impressed is very much that it is a kind of one big machine, and you experience that especially when you use the underground and all the kind of uh, flyovers that you're in. And Michelle Provost has written a, a very marvelous article on that in uh, in Argis. Again, these incredible densities, this purely economical architecture based on on uh, economical calculations. These very thin uh, sort of pencil buildings. And then, of course, constantly this, this traffic that, that moves through and or even over uh, this city. city. Sorry. <laughs> and it seems to be, I mean, this kind of infrastructural kind of, kind, of, kind of networks that you see in the harbor are reflected on the inner side of, uh, of these kind of uh, shopping centers, like in this case, the Dragon Center, which has on top this kind of roller coaster, ice skating ring, and all kinds of merry-go-rounds, and uh, I don't know what where these people enjoy themselves. Good, sorry. Then we get to China, then you cross the border, and suddenly every, everything becomes different. I couldn't read this, but these are the kind of big kind of billboards that you see everywhere in China, where this kind of new Chinese society uh, is, is announced. I can't read it, some of you uh, can. It would be interesting what, what they say here, but even if you can't read it, you can, you can see what, what is su suggested here of a kind of new pros prosperity. These are both taken, I think, in, uh, in Zhuhai, in the Pearl River Delta, one of these special economical zones. And this is actually uh, Shenzhen, the kind of city that, li uh, that lies next to, uh, to Hong Kong. And that is so fascinating to Rem Kolhas that he would actually say that he would rather live there than in Almere, which is a kind of suburbia in the Netherlands. And you see on the left, Deng, with a kind of artist's impression of, uh, of this city. And when you turn your head, it's already built. <laughs> and it's, very, it's, it's quite fascinating who, on the one hand, this guy Deng is so present uh, I will show you some things later. And on the other hand, how this is completely turned into a kind of capitalist society. Um, on the left, you see a picture that we were not allowed to see ourselves. And this is this, these are the so-called smart uh, farmers' uh, houses. It means little plots of lands that farmers, uh, uh, farmers uh, got when it turned into a special economical zone. What they did is they, they tore down their farm, built a kind of small uh, kind of urban villa on top of it, rented the spaces, uh, earned money, and when they had earned enough money, they tore it down, and so it slowly grew until these kind of uh, developments within 10 years. And um, that is actually quite spectacular. We, we were there and we wanted to see this, and we passed it, we passed this road with a, with a van, and there we still had a Chinese guide, and we wanted to see that, and we passed it again and again, and they said, no, it's, it's not there anymore. We, we tore it down and said, we, we can see it. We want to see it. And then he said, finally, he got so desperate that he said, oh, no, no old buildings. Shenzhen is a modern city. And, but 
we were absolutely not allowed to see this. So this is the ideal and this is not there. And these are actually examples of the kind of buildings the city planning office uh, designs and uh, you think you're walking around in this kind of uh, showroom and you get outside and they are already there. planning of the city and then strangely enough on one end so very capitalist but when you look at the hilltop here there will be of course the statue of Deng uh, blessing uh, this uh, city. Uh, here's some images of this uh, city center. I've never seen a more kind of gloomy uh, kind of place and all these cities have three kind of uh, theme parks. One a kind of ordinary lunar park, one something like this in Shenzhen which is called Windows on the World, a kind of place like what you used to have on world exhibitions where you can see all kind of cultural artifacts of the world uh, assembled in, uh, in a copied form which, they can, which you can see. And the third one is of course always dealing with the Chinese history with a kind of replica of the Forbidden City and a, repli a replica of the Great Wall. And here you see, oh, I don't know. And here you see the only picture that I could take of this kind of smart farmers kind of development with on the other side the, 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 the new high rises. And here you see that this old city is torn down, taken away, and uh, the new one is uh, built. And here you see, you can see the first shopping mall of China, a kind of uh, John Jurdy kind of could be jealous uh, could, uh, about this or could envy this. And you see that it's actually a place where one girl after another comes in and has herself uh, photographed by uh, another uh, girl. But basically, most, uh, still most of these people work uh, and live in these kind of conditions in a kind of model factory. Unfortunately, for some reason, I didn't take the photographs of this factory, but you can see the factory, the kind of rows of boxes, or kind of Hilbersheimer boxes. And on the other side are the dormitories, which are the same kind of boxes. And there, these kind of uh, girls uh, live, beautiful girls live in these kind of uh, bedrooms with, of course, still Mao uh, on the wall, but also a kind of guitar with, on which they play pro probably kind of rockabilly stuff. This is a place where they eat, so you can see how immense it is. And this is the place where on, uh, let's say, a Saturday night, uh, a kind of, uh, they will be made beautiful uh, in the same kind of uh, process as uh, they produce uh, toys uh, for us. We are not allowed to take photographs inside of the factory. And these are the animals. The, uh, a couple of thousand goose are killed uh, every day there, for which they eat. So then you drive through. This is such an example of such a historical theme park. This is the kind of architecture that you see on your way there. This is the kind of architecture they aspire. It looks familiar for you, I suppose. And now we get to Zuhai, which is... Um, so this is the ideal of the, of the, of the kind of average uh, Chinese kind of guy. This is Suhai, a uh, place kind of holiday resort for the Chinese, also a special economical zone and the kind of most incredible prostitution city that I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, when you would get into your, your hotel room, they would try to squeeze themselves uh, in uh, with you. I mean, the, the, kind of, the kind of scenes you, I mean, you may be thinking that I'm ex exaggerating, but I'm actually trying to be very quick here. Anyway. Finally, then this kind of Blade, Ritter, uh, uh, Blade Runner city, which is Macau, Portuguese, uh, like Hong Kong was uh, British, and now in a kind of strange state that we could not completely figure out. This is the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, what is it, will it be, 70s kind of development of Macau. This is the kind of uh, historical kind of city, which with this kind of an, uh, of an underworld in it, and all these cages cages everywhere in China. And we couldn't really figure, I hope there are some, some people here in the audience that maybe could explain to me why uh, the people put these cages on these houses. Because the only place uh, to start with where you don't see them is a project by an architect that we know. That is a project, a large urban quarter that is planned by Alvaro Siza. 
and it is completely unsuccessful. Nobody wants to live there. Uh, very monumental. You, you have, from this image, you don't really have an idea how big it is. Um, but nobody wants to live there because the, the apartments have galleries and just as everywhere in the world, no one wants to live in a gallery. Uh, and these kind of things that look very similar but don't have galleries are very successful. And you see again all these, all these kind of cages that people individually uh, attach to their kind of niche, as uh, Bernard Cash would probably call it, in this building and where they live. Some, some people explained it that it was a kind of traditional thing because most of the people that come here immediately come from the countryside and that you would have it there to protect your kind of uh, the things you have. Others say it is because you, they have these clothes always hanging there and that they would others fly away. But we couldn't really figure out, I mean, for, for your security on, let's say, the 40th the, the floor, you don't really need a cage because no one would climb in, would they? Would they? Okay. Try to make it uh, quick to finish it. In his essay, Living in a Post-Traditional -tradition Society, the British uh, soci sociologist Anthony Giddens describes the effects of the rise and of what he calls abstract systems. And these are institutional networks of specialists who found their decisions and authority on scientific facts and methods. These abstract systems penetrate all layers of society at a global level as well uh, uh, on that of the everyday life of the individual. And according to Giddens, in the second phase of modernity, we all live, uh, we, we all continuously form part of experiments, some large, some small, whose outcome is as open and uncertain as the great modernist experiments w which were connected with uh, uh, humanity as a whole. Technology, in the general sense of the word, word has a de determining influence both mat materially and in the form of spe uh, specialized social expertise. The effects of this can be seen all over Asia in far more literal and extreme forms than in the West. If there's one thing that expresses the quintessence, quintessence of contemporary Asia, it's numbers. It is, this is, of course, primarily, uh, this, of course, primarily relates to the population growth, migration from the country to the city, and the econo economy. The evidence of these phenomena is almost entirely numerical. Though th this, uh, this had resulted in numbers being given a cultural value, and conversely, being able to express these values. That most of Asian architecture and urban design appears to us to be so unashamedly direct does not mean that it is without culture. On the contrary, it is precisely this that makes it an expression of the essence of our times. Numbers have become a universal language, allowing us to connect the most disparate of phenomena and distill patterns from them. The knowledge of these patterns and the values attached to them does make it possible to operate using complex systems of laws and technical interventions. Uh, with uh, 6.5 million of inhabitants, Guangzhou, the former Canton, is a large city in uh, the Pearl River Delta in China. And unlike most cities uh, in this region, which have grown up from practically nothing, Guangzhou has a long history. It used to be uh, Canton, and the city center is still has retained a largely traditional character. Small streets designed for pedestrian traffic and a highly de uh, densified colonial center. The city is growing extremely rapidly, however. Between 1982 and 1983, the density of the population, measured in terms of the number of people per square kilometer, has almost doubled, growing from 478 to 893. Furthermore, the floating population of migrants rose from 306,000 in 1980 to 1.3 million in 1989. With the growth and density of Guangzhou's population, the amount of traffic has naturally also increased. Although no figures are available, it is clear that since 1993, the number of cars in particular has risen enormously. The average, average speed of public transport has dropped from 17 kilometers per hour, which is at 10 miles per hour, to less than 10 kilometers per hour, which is, I think, six miles, seven miles since the 1960s. 
And that is really true. You can hardly move through the city. The city uh, practically grinds to, to, to a halt during the rush hour. All these facts are constantly being measured, and that's what you see on these two images. There. On all these bridges uh, over motorways, there are these kind of people counting all the vehicles that, uh, that, uh, that pass by. It's not that they do that electronically, that like they would do it over here. <laughs> yep. But um, they do it by hand, like a, like a typist. And these kind of guys are immediately linked to these kind of building sites. So, um, uh, to, alleviate, uh, to, uh, to alleviate the congestion, numerous infrastructural projects ranging from bridges and ring roads to an underground system have been developed. However, the most characteristic of the city are the enormous viaducts that run either above on an existing road, thereby multiplying the road surface area, or a, uh, a long existing riverbed. Here, the abstract system of tra traffic literally solidifies into what MVRDV would call a datascape. Numbers take on a material form and give rise to a new and artificial landscape above the existing landscape that attempts to connect with a much larger regional and sup supra-regional scale. Not unusual in itself, perhaps, but the speed of developments and the contrast with the existing landscape have brought a spectacular quality to Guangzhou. One experiences this mainly below the new roads, where, for the time being, the uh, traditional city and traditional life continue to exist in some, some, some form as a kind of underworld. According to uh, Ant Anthony Giddens, the creation of abstract systems is the reason why traditional ways of life are being disembedded, deprived of their original social embedding. We are now in a, in a phase in which these ways of life are re-embedded. And this is literally visible in this riverbed at Guangzhou, or at least it's symbolical for it. Below in the underworld, traditional life carries on in the markets, temples and small streets, where goods for the market are still partly delivered by boat. Above are the new roads that carry their users far away in no, no time at all. Shipping, pedestrian and motor traffic all use the same embedding. But being much larger systems, they embed the area around the riverbed in an entirely different ways. Steadily, we see building lining the main roads uh, wither and already evers, every so often modern high-rise looms up. And I must say, as if, as if in a strange dream, uh, I remember a journey by auto rickshaw in the evening rush hour, uh, during which I suddenly realized that the wide avenue along which we were driving was so crowded that you could have crossed it, crossed it over the head and roofs of the rest of the traffic, and that it was surrounded by buildings of at least five stories high and covered entirely in concrete panels. So there was a concrete ceiling above us, and the dusk uh, underneath there was not simply due to the lateness of the hour, the sun simply couldn't penetrate down to the street below. And the hallucinatory nature of the roar of traffic was caused, caused by the reverberations inside this gigantic concrete arena, which almost at a certain point started to work like a kind of church. So I will end with this kind of filmic impression of this trip along this river underneath this, uh, this motorway. You can see how people are still playing chess there on cards. And there on the left you see these high rises rising up with the kind of bamboo lattice um, in front of it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions, maybe?